Good morning, Edgewater Church family. What a glorious day it is on Palm Sunday here. Who's got their palms? Let me see. Yeah.
down in our heart. Amen. Well, as we enter into this Holy Week, what a journey we will be taking this week. From him coming in, riding on a donkey, everybody waving their palms, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. To on Thursday, when he has to have his last supper with his disciples, to Friday, and then to Sunday. We will be taking a journey again. Some of you have been with us before where this journey is. We try to take it back to where it was, not just it's a story. And oh, yes, and we know the ending. We don't want to skip the beginning, to the middle, to the end, to the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning as we sing Hosanna, we want to just try to place back in time. He was entering in there.
take a few moments. Let's pray together, please. God, as these uh, hosannas still echo through uh, the, the room, God, we are reminded of uh, that day that we celebrate today, this Palm Sunday, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, as the crowd gathered to see uh, the, the spectacle as, as crowds have a tendency to do. And God, we realize that uh, Many of the same voices who on that, uh, that Sunday were calling out uh, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We know that many of those same voices a few days later would be, would be crying out, crucify him. Because God, we know that this world is dynamic in that it, it doesn't hold necessarily to one thing or another and the, the opinions of the crowd can be swayed. But God, I pray that you uh, help us to know that we are called out from the crowd, to not be swayed by, by the whims of the crowd, by the emotions of whatever day may be happening. But God, help us in the midst of our joyful times to be able to say, Hosanna, and in the midst of our sorrowful times, to still be able to say, Hosanna. To know that whatever it is that we're going through in our lives, that we can, that we can turn it over to you. That our relationship with you is not based on, on how we happen to feel at the moment. But instead that we can turn our hearts to you completely. So God, on this day of praise, as we've waved palm branches, uh, we help us, help us to take a look at our lives, to be able to see areas um, for which we want to praise you. Ways that maybe you're working right now, maybe ways that you have worked in the past. Because God, your past history with us is what gives us a lot of times the courage to, to take a new step out on faith, to continue this journey uh, with, with hope knowing that, uh, that you do work and you do move, and, and there are so many things that we want to praise you for. And so we want to take a few moments right now, just in a little bit of silent prayer, to, uh, to lift our praises up to you. God, we pray that you uh, continue to, to work and move. Remind us of your, your faithfulness, especially in, in times that are, that are tough for us. Remind us of, of your great love for us. Remind us of the ways that you have uh, come through for us in the past. Uh, we pray especially this morning for our uh, sister churches in, in Cuba as, uh, as they are celebrating Palm Sunday today as well. I pray that their worship will be uh, rich and meaningful and that new people will be drawn into relationship with you. And so, God, as, as others across this country, across this world have gathered to, to, to pray to you today, uh, we want to do so as well as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning. 
It is so good to see all of you gathered here today on this uh, wonderful Palm Sunday. Thank you so much for taking the time to come, especially if you're here today for the first time. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, we're, if you didn't get a chance to do so on the way in, please be sure to stop by our Welcome Center right out there in the center of the lobby. There's information there that will help you to get to know our church a little bit better. Um, if you are here for the first, second, or third time, please take a moment, if you will, fill out one of those little yellow cards that you'll find in the chairs in front of you. A little bit later on in the service, those will go in the baskets. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on today, uh, so I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to go through the bulletin. I do just want to make sure that you you remember that today is the day we're doing our, our beach baptism. We're really excited about that. They're going to be at uh, a Blind Pass Beach, Middle Beach. It's the same place, just two different names. Uh, so pick one of those and, and show up there. And uh, just as a reminder, we're not going to be starting at the beach. There's a pavilion on the other side of the parking lot. We're going to be starting there. So when you get there, go to the pavilion, and then we'll make our way as a group down to the beach. Uh, but it's going to be a wonderful time. We're really looking forward to that today at 2 o'clock. Um, also, don't forget, we've got our, our schedule of things going on this week, as, as Rob alluded to earlier, uh, just this wonderful journey that we take through this week. If you haven't gotten a chance to come to, to some of the, the services on, on Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday, I really encourage you to do so. On, on both of those nights, we start at 6.30, and it'll be right here in the sanctuary on, on Monday, Thursday, we do kind of a, a reenactment of the Last Supper right up here on the, on the platform. And then, and then uh, as we get to a certain point in the service, uh, we, everyone gets a chance to come down and, and have communion 12 at a time right here uh, at the table. And so it's almost like you're part of the scene, part of the picture. And it's a very moving time. And then, and then Good Friday, uh, words can't really describe what the Good Friday service is like. It's a very powerful time. It just draws us to the cross to get a chance to to see and remember what it is that, that happened with Jesus. And it's a really uh, powerful time. I encourage you to come and, and check those out this week. And then get a chance to be back here again next week for Easter Sunday. I do want to just remind you, as, as we are going to be having lots of folks coming for, for Easter Sunday, uh, that if you're just one of the regular folks in the Edgewater Church family, um, I, I encourage you to, to start out over in the gathering place, just so that we have plenty of Plenty of seats here for folks. We're going to have singers over there leading in worship over there. Uh, but, but if there is room over here, um, remember, sit towards the outsides or sit towards the middle or towards these scary seats in the front, um, just so that there are plenty of seats for the folks who may be coming for the first time or maybe it's the once a year that they come. We want to be sure to extend a good welcome to them. Um, like, so take some time to look through the rest of the bulletin. Uh, this is also a, an exciting weekend because uh, we have an opportunity to get a chance to uh, uh, to to have our Cuban pastors with us. They're going to be a part of the, uh, the beach baptism, which is going to be a great experience. But this is their last Sunday here with us, so I've invited them to come and, and share a, a little bit uh, just to, to say uh, hello and goodbye and, and thank you, and, uh, except they'll be saying it in Spanish. And, um, and, but let's give them an Edgewater welcome as they come today. La iglesia celebra la Semana Santa, Holy Week. y hoy es un día especial. And today is a special day. Jesús entró Jesus got triunfantemente a la ciudad de Jerusalén. To Jerusalem. Si también nosotros caminamos And we also walking. como Él caminó, As he walked, también nuevas puertas se abrirán also the new doors will open para la victoria en Cristo Jesús. For the victory of Jesus Dios le bendiga. God bless you all. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dios es muy bueno. God is very good. Amen. Estamos muy contentos, muy alegres. We're very happy, very joyful. Por haber estado en este lugar. For being in this place. Durante todo un mes. Throughout the whole month. Sentimos mucho. We're sorry. Y ya se nos acaba el tiempo. But the time is over. Pero lo hemos pasado bien. We have spent a good time. Damos muchas gracias a Dios so thank you to the Lord por esta oportunidad, for this opportunity, por conocerlos a ustedes, for knowing you all, por tener nuevos amigos or have new friends, con los cuales hemos compartido en sus casas, in your homes, en el templo, in the temple, en los servicios de la iglesia. In all the service that we have. Eh, doy gracias a Dios to, I thank the Lord, porque he podido tomar muchas fotos. We have been, I've been able to take many pictures. Las cuales llevo a Cuba, les recuerdo. We're going to take it 
to Cuba as a memory. Así que ahí aparecen muchos de ustedes. So many of you are, will show up here. In the <laughs> okay. <laughs> eh, mientras adorábamos al Señor en este servicio, while we adored the Lord in this service, sentía caer la unción del Espíritu Santo en I este lugar. The Spirit, this, the Holy Spirit. Y sentía como si a la vez estuviese en mi iglesia en Cuba. Like Cuba. Puedo disfrutarlo de una manera especial. Special como estoy sintiendo su presencia ahora. Right Amén. Y si el pastor Dan me permite, allows, quisiera hacer una pequeña oración like para que Dios siga bendiciendo este lugar. Be okay. Amén. Antes quisiera decirles que I would like to tell you doy gracias a ustedes porque así como se abrieron las puertas de Jerusalén para que Jesús entrara triunfalmente, damos gracias a Dios por haber abierto sus corazones, permitiéndonos entrar en ellos. Vamos a orar. Señor Jesucristo, te doy gracias por esta ocasión gloriosa for this glorious occasion, por el pastor Daniel for this opportunity, por toda la visión que él tiene de trabajo for all the that you have for us in yo the ruego le sigas prosperando y bendiciendo mira su proyecto de construcción del templo look, look at your that are built. en este día oh Dios in this day today, abre las puertas open the doors, provee las finanzas provee los recursos los obreros aun si fuese necesario envía a tus ángeles para que ellos sigan extendiendo tu reino que este pacto que nos une continuamente esté fluyendo entre nuestros pueblos y que de ambos pueblos seamos un solo pueblo el pueblo santo de Dios thank you Jesús thank you Lord amen Dios le bendiga thank you gracias Gracias. Um, we have a, uh, again, with, with so many wonderful things going on this week, it, I've really been looking forward to this Palm Sunday. We, we have the opportunity uh, coming up at the 11 o'clock service to get a chance to celebrate with a, a group of, of students who have gone through confirmation class. They've gone through like 16 weeks of, of training, uh, getting to know what it means to be a, a Christian, to learn about the, the Methodist church, to learn about our church. And, and it's just a wonderful opportunity. And they're actually going to be getting a chance to be confirmed at the 11 o'clock service. And, and, uh, and they're going to be joining the church. But we also have a whole class of, of new members joining as well. And now are there, are there any... Any of them here today? We, we weren't sure at this service. Anyone? All right, good. All right, good deal. Come on down. So any other new members, come on forward, if you will, please. And uh, oh, there we go. We've got some more. Good. All right. Well, let's give them a welcome as they come. Well, this is the time that the ushers are ready to uh, come through with the baskets. Uh, if you have those yellow cards filled out. Uh, those will those will go in the baskets now. This is also the time that we do bring our tithes and our offerings that we talked about in the covenant a few minutes ago. Uh, we want to bring these things to God to, to say thank you to him for the way that he works and moves in our lives, to, to be able to give back to him a portion of what he's given us uh, to enjoy in the first place. And so uh, I'm going to ask the ushers now to please come forward to receive the offering this morning.
All right, well, I knew uh, with, with such a big day today with so many uh, incredible things going on and, and getting a chance to, to be blessed by our, our, our Cuban pastors, and uh, um, I, I knew we'd be running a little short on time. Let me, uh, you know, I just need to adjust my clock down there so I can, you, you know what it means when the pastor adjusts the clock so he can see when he starts a sermon? You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. Um, so, um, all right, so... Uh, that's right. So, uh, all right, uh, we're continuing our series on on looking at how God uh, is transforming our lives as we get ready to see what His Word has in store for us. Let's take a moment. Let's pray together, please. God, thank you for this time together this morning. I pray that you will give me the words to say that you want me to say, that you will help us to hear what you want us to hear, that you will give us the courage and the strength to act on it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we are uh, continuing this series uh, called Transformers as we, we've been looking at Romans chapter 12 and, and looking at uh, the, this call that God has for us to, to transform our lives, to, to be willing to, to put ourselves on the altar as living sacrifices so that God can, can work this transformation in our lives. Uh, and then last week we started looking a little bit at, at what does that look like? What, what is this transformed life look like. Uh, and, and so we, we just covered two verses, but those two verses were, were just packed full of, of stuff where, where we talked about the fact that we need to love one another sincerely. We need to, uh, to hate that which is evil and to cling to that which is good, that we need to be devoted to one another in love, that we need to honor one another above ourselves. Uh, today, we're going to be kind of continuing on with the list. We're not going to get a chance to go through, through all of it, um, but, but we, I do want to go ahead and just kind of read the, the context that we're working from today in Romans chapter 12, verses 11 through 16, where it says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So again, we've got this, this whole list of, of things, of, of, of character qualities to build into our lives. Things that we want to strive for, that we want to have this transformation take place in our life. And it's my hope that as we've gone through some of these, that we're able to kind of take this uh, as we do a lot of times with Scripture and, and use it as a mirror and kind of see how we're doing in, in, in reflecting that. How, are, are we living these things out in our lives? Um, as, as we're starting today, we're going to just kind of roll back to the, the, the beginning of that section where it, it used the words zeal and fervor. Uh, how many of you used the words zeal and fervor in conversation this week? Uh, yeah, every day. Yeah, no problem. I just, it's just part of it. No, of course not. We, we don't use those words a whole lot um, anymore. So maybe you could kind of summarize that, that, that statement by saying that we need to serve God with diligence and enthusiasm. Serve God with diligence and enthusiasm. So he says, first, never be lacking in zeal and then keep your spiritual fervor. Okay, so zeal means like to have earnest effort. To, to be working hard at it. If you were to use this word to describe an employee that you had, maybe the employee would be someone that, uh, that always shows up early and stays late and doesn't slack off through the day. Uh, if, if you were to apply the word zeal to, to an athlete, it, it would be the, 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 the football player who doesn't take a play off for the whole game. It could be the baseball player who every time they step to the plate, they're, they're in the zone ready to take the ball out of the park. When it could be the Olympic athlete that, that trained so hard for so many years with the, the single-minded goal of, of, of getting that gold medal. Um, and, and it's with this kind of single-minded passion that we're supposed to pursue our relationship with God. That, that, that means giving 100% in whatever ministry it is that you're involved in. Whether it's, it's children's church or the praise team or, or, or helping others or serving or prayer or whatever, whatever the case may be. To, to serve God with, with diligence means giving 100% in ministry, in worship, in, in meditation on God's word, in, in developing our life of prayer, things like that. And, and then when he talks about spiritual fervor, He's not so much talking about like what we do, but the attitude that we have while we do it. Um, spiritual fervor is like spiritual enthusiasm. Um, so, so not only do we need to work hard for God, we need to get a little excited about it too. 
Uh, the, the word fervor here comes from the Greek word that kind of means a boiling. That, that there's kind of this natural excitement ready to flow over, kind of a, a, a passion. Um, and, and, and we should have this kind of passionate attitude in, in our worship. Uh, we, we should be excited about our time in God's word. We, we should be enthusiastic about using the gifts that God has given us to serve God and to serve other people. I know that the reality is, is that we may not always feel like it, but, but you know what, that, that's okay. Um, uh, this transformation that God wants to bring about in our lives, it, it cannot be solely based on emotion. Because you know how it is, emotions come and go depending on what the weather is like outside or, or what people around us may be saying. So, so we don't want it based on that, that it's just going to kind of blow with the wind. We want this to be a, a conscious decision that we're making, that, that we're stepping forward to be able to live out this transformation um, with, with, uh, with a good attitude. And, and the neat thing about it is, is that sometimes when we go ahead and make that conscious decision, even if we don't necessarily feel like it at the time, when we make that conscious decision and we start walking in that way, you know what happens? The feelings tend to follow. Okay, so, so, so be faithful, have that spiritual fervor uh, and zeal, jump forward, serve God with diligence and enthusiasm. Now, now the next couple of statements that they made, that, were, were, that Paul made, it says, uh, was, was basically talking about that we need to have joy, patience, and, 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 and prayer, and then need to develop those things. And you could, you could kind of leave it at that, but if you look at kind of the, the, the context that it's put in, it, it could be better summed up by saying that we need to trust in and depend on God, even especially in difficult times. Especially in difficult times. So, so we could just kind of stay on the, the little topics of joy and patience and prayer, but I think that these are, are in the context of of affliction that it talked about. Um, he, he's calling for an attitude of trust and dependence on God. A person cannot be truly joyful um, unless they're trusting God for a, a hopeful future. A, a person can't be patient in the midst of difficult times unless they have an absolute trust and dependence that God is going to be with them and is going to take them through the difficult time that they're facing. Um, Paul says to be faithful in prayer because there's no greater sign of dependence on God than, than to continue to pray to him when times are tough. So, so let's, let's break those three down just a little bit here. He, talks, he says, be joyful in hope. Be joyful in hope. Now, we talk a lot about joy. There's a great spirit of joy in this church. Um, it's, it's one of the defining characteristics that we should have as a Christian. Um, it was an attitude that the apostles in the early church showed. Um, it, it's a spiritual... Uh, a, a, fruit of the spirit that that we uh that we read about uh, um that the holy spirit produces in our lives it, it's something that actually we're we're commanded to do uh, all throughout scripture it's in places like uh first thessalonians five sixteen, where it says pretty plain and simply always be joyful okay we, we have all sorts of reasons to be joyful especially as followers of jesus christ i mean first we've been forgiven of our sins I mean, I don't know about you, that's a big deal for me, because there's a, there's a long list of stuff that I've been forgiven of, that I have an opportunity to, to, to step into life with a clear conscience and, and not feel guilty, and, and I've been forgiven, and so that's a great source of joy. We can be joyful over just the wonderful blessings that God pours out into our lives that sometimes we, we tend to take for granted. But, but also, we, we can be joyful in the fact that, that that this life that we're in right now and, and the, the pain and suffering and difficulty that we sometimes go through is, is nothing going to be compared to the hope that we have in eternity. And, and, and if, if we don't believe and trust in God that, that, that the future is going to be better than our present, then of course we're going to lose our joy and we're going to give in to despair. That's why, why Paul says we need to be joyful in hope. Um, how many of you have ever known someone who was pregnant? Anyone? Okay, yeah, we've all known someone who, who is pregnant, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a great example to me of being joyful in hope, even in the midst of difficult times. I mean, how, I, I just don't understand how a woman who's, who's gained 30 pounds, uh, had, whose back hurts constantly, has heard about the, the, uh, the, the pain of labor that's upcoming, that they can still be joyful. Well, that's because they know that the, the pain is temporary, but they're going to be able to have the, this hope for this great future ahead of them. It's the same for us as Christ followers. We're going to run into difficulties in this life. We're, we're going to have uh, emotional and physical pain, uh, sickness, persecution, and so on. But, but we know by faith 
what the future is going to be, and so we can be joyful in hope. So, so we're also reminded to be patient in affliction. Uh, does, does it seem sometimes that the problems that you have in life, that they just never end, and it's just one thing after another, after another, after another? If you, if you said yes to that, well, you're, you're not alone. We, we all experience that from time to time. Lots of times, trouble in life seems to come in, in bunches, and, and the problem is, is that it's not quickly resolved. We, we, we live in kind of this sitcom world where we would love to have all of our problems taken care of in a 30-minute time slot minus commercials. And, 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 then, and then it's all taken care of. But we know the reality is that's just not how it works. Um, how, can, how can we be patient in affliction? Well, the answer is by having faith in God. We, we can only be patient in difficult times if we believe that God is in control and, and that he's working everything out for our good. We're not very patient as a society. Uh, we, we, we eat fast food, and we, even if you cook at home, sometimes you'll just microwave a one-minute meal. We, we go to ATMs because we don't want to actually like, get out of the car to go and, and actually talk to somebody. Um, we live in a society where we, are, where we are accustomed to, and we expect everything to be handled quickly. But that's not the case when we run into difficulties in our lives. We can't just kind of kind of say a prayer or quote a scripture and, hey, the problem's gone. It, it doesn't work that way. We need to trust God even when sometimes it seems like the work that he's doing in us is, is a slow process. Because honestly, sometimes the, the pace of the work that God does is part of the process of developing us. So we need to learn to be patient in affliction. And then the third thing right there, Paul says, is that we need to be faithful in prayer. Now, now, why would Paul even bother saying you need to be faithful in prayer in difficult times? I mean, bad times, that seems like that's when, we, that's when we pray. We may not pray in good times, but when the bad stuff hits, hey, we, we, we throw up a prayer, no problem. But, but the thing is, is that we need to be faithful in prayer. Because sometimes the bad stuff hits, and what do we do? We say a prayer, and we go, no, 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 no. amen. Well, Come on, and, and, and we're expecting God to, to just immediately respond. And, and, and then when he doesn't, what do we do? We go, ah, never mind. And, and, we, and we just try to work it out ourselves anyhow. And we end up making the problem bigger than it was in the first place. So, so that's not being faithful in prayer. We need to continue to persevere in prayer. It takes genuine trust in God and dependence on God to, to faithfully pray in the midst of our difficulties. So, so um, the, this list kind of goes on, and, and the next kind of area could be summarized by saying that, we need to, that you need to open your wallet for Christians in need. You need to open your wallet for Christians in need. The Bible says that we have a social responsibility to care for other Christians. Uh, one, one of the things that every Christian should do should be in some type of, of, of effort and sacrifice for others in the church family. And, and that's church with a capital C. So including supporting our, our sister churches in, in Cuba. Um, so we need to... Uh, it, now, sharing with other Christians, that's not necessarily one of those glamorous things in ministry. It's not like preaching or playing the drums or all these other things that are up in front of people. But you know what? I think that the, the giving to one another in need, I think that's really close to the heart of God. I mean, Jesus said that the people would know us to be his followers by how we love and care for one another. Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 13 that it's love that matters most. Um, the Apostle John points out that, that, that we do not love one another unless we are sharing with those in need. Now, I, I know at Edgewater, we, we do that a lot in a lot of different ways. We do a lot of outreach ministry, and, and, and that's wonderful, and we do uh, support ministries around the world. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to be reminded about it, that, that it's important for us to remember to, to be willing to participate in the giving at, at, at church um, because our, our love for one another and, and our willingness to share, unless we're intentional about continuing to develop it, it it's going gonna, it's gonna to slide away, uh, especially when, when economic tough times hit because, you know, when those hit, what do we do? We tend to, to turn and, and focus on ourselves. Now, now, not only does this passage talk about the fact that we need to be open and sharing with, with other Christians, but it also says that we need to basically make it a practice to be friendly with everyone. To make it a practice to be friendly with everyone. The, uh, 
the, the verse actually said that we need to practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Now, back in the, the New Testament days when this was written, the hospitality was a little different because there was kind of an obligation that if someone was traveling through town and they wanted to, to, to stop and stay in a town, that, that you would take them in for the night and you would feed them and give them shelter. Um, we don't so much do that today. I don't know what would happen if someone showed up at your door that you had no idea who they were and they knocked and said, hey, we're just passing through. You mind if we just stay in your house tonight? Probably, uh, probably wouldn't, wouldn't happen. Uh, we, we just don't do that. But we, we have the opportunity to practice hospitality in all sorts of different ways. Um, maybe, maybe as you're driving down the road, if someone is, is pulled over to the side of the road and, and they've got uh, um, the car troubles, maybe you stop and help. Maybe instead of just driving by your neighbor's house with, when their garbage can has blown out into the road, you, you stop and you, and you put it back in their driveway. Uh, we, we, we need to be able to be kind to, to others, especially now as we're getting ready to head into uh, to Easter next week, as folks are going to be coming here. We want to be able to, to reach out and give a, a kind and warm and welcoming atmosphere here. And then, then the verse went on. This is the last one we're going to talk about today. Um, it basically says to, to do good and not evil to those who repeatedly hurt you. Now, the word that the, the Bible uses is persecute. And a lot of times we kind of um, limit that word to talking about, um, about religious, uh, being persecuted for your religious beliefs. But really, being persecuted is basically being repeatedly hurt, um, with, whether it's physical or financial or verbal or, or emotional. So, so how, how do we respond to those who hurt us repeatedly? Um, the, the, the employer that treats us unfairly. How do, you, how do you treat a neighbor who is just intentionally doing things just to drive you crazy? How, how do you deal with a co-worker who's not treating you right? How do you treat those who have lied to you, who falsely accused you, who have deceived you, who have che- cheated or betrayed you or physically harmed you? Well, Paul gives the answer to these uh, there in verse 14. Where it, where it says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, there are kind of two parts to this verse. There's kind of a, a positive slant and a negative slant as well. The positive is that we're, we are to bless, but the negative says that we are not to curse. Now, now the whole not to curse thing, I think as, as Christians, we can kind of buy into that some. We realize we're not supposed to return evil for evil, and, 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 and we can say, okay, well, I, I know I'm not supposed to respond that way, um, the Bible says, uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. So I'll leave that in his hands. But the thing is, is that the Bible doesn't say, um, be neutral to those who persecute you. What does it say? It says we need to bless those who persecute us. What, what does this look like? There's a story about uh, uh, Wade Boggs, a famous, famous baseball player. He played for the Red Sox. And uh, any time he went into Yankee Stadium, there was always a big rivalry there. And, and uh, there was one fan in particular that just drove him crazy. He was sat in a, a box seat right there on the third baseline. And, and uh, Wade would come out to begin his pregame warm-ups and ritual. And this guy would just start in right away. He'd, Boggs, you stink! Except he'd, he's a New York guy. He'd probably say something a little, a little stronger than that, maybe. Um, but, uh, but finally, Boggs had had enough. He, he walked over to the guy, and he said, look, man, are you the guy who keeps yelling at me all the time? And of course, the guy stands up, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And, uh, and, and Wade took a new baseball out of his pocket, and he autographed it, and he handed it to the guy. And, and the man never yelled at Wade Boggs again. Uh, as a matter of fact, he became one of Wade's biggest fans right there at Yankee Stadium. Now, now, we've all seen stories on the news of how players have handled antagonistic fans by, by not handing them a ball, but throwing a ball at them, or, or basketball players jumping into the stands and starting fights. Um, but, but Wade Boggs dealt with his tormentor by doing good to him. You may find yourself in, in Wade Boggs' situation someday. Maybe for no apparent reason, um, someone may decide to not like you. And maybe it's something you did. Maybe it's something you didn't do. Maybe, maybe it's, it's something you were not even aware of or you have no control over. But suddenly you find yourself in a, in a hostile situation. Now, our, our natural inclination is, is to fight back. Um, but, but there's a better way to handle the situation. As, as Christians, we are to do good and not evil to those who have repeatedly hurt us. I think it's really important for us to keep this in mind, especially as we head into this, this Holy Week. 
as, as we remember Jesus' story, as, as he was uh, beaten and humiliated and, and tortured, and, and man, when they put that first nail through his wrist, he could have said, God, just fry them all. He, he could have done that, uh, but he didn't. What, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's the kind of character that we need to build into our lives. To, to be able to bless those who, who are actively trying to hurt us. I know, it's, I know it's hard. But Jesus set that example for us. And there were so many things that Jesus set the example for us. So we remember these things especially as we, we come into this time of communion. We remember the, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. We remember the way that he gathered with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed and he, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, Drink, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this time today and for this uh, opportunity to kind of look at what a transformed life looks like. God, wherever it is in our lives that you have been uh, maybe poking a little bit through this series to say, you know, this is an area that I need to work on a little more. I, I pray that you give us the uh, strength to, to make those decisions, to move in the way that you want us to. And so draw near to us during this time. Speak to our hearts. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The communion table in the United Methodist Church is open to all who will come who are seeking after a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The way that we do it here at Edgewater is the ushers will set up a couple of stations in the aisles. As they direct you, if you're able to get up out of your seat, you just go to one of those stations. If you're not able to get up out of your seat, just let the ushers know. They'll be happy to serve you where you're seated. Um, As you come up to the the station, you uh, tear a piece of the bread off, dip it in the juice, and then you can eat it. At that point, if you'd like to come and spend some time in prayer at the altar, you may, or you can just return to your seat. But I'm going to ask those who are assisting with communion this morning now to uh, please come forward. My Savior leads me. Who have I to ask beside? How could I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my
Well, far too often we, uh, we have a tendency to uh, move through this Holy Week season uh, too quickly. Um, I, I say this every year, and, and every year it's still true, that, uh, that we, we miss out on something. If we move from the, from the Hosannas of Palm Sunday to the He is Risen of Easter without taking a, a journey past the cross. So if you can make it here on Thursday or Friday or both, I encourage you to do so. If not, maybe take some time to, uh, to be reminded, to read through the story once again. But as we kind of close our time today, we're going to end a little bit differently. And I'm gonna, we're going to just show a little video, and it's set to the tune of the old hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And uh, just to, to take a little bit of time and allow God to speak to you uh, in this time. So, uh, and, and I look forward to seeing you here uh, next week.